thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Bill. Thanks, Michelle, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, HBK Monthly Risk Advisory Services webinar. Um, again, as Michelle said, my name is Bill Haven. I'm a senior director with HBK and our risk advisory service practice. Um, this morning, we, we've got the, um, the luxury of having three experts from our uh, um, MSP entity within HBK Vertilocity, and we're going to be discussing um, protecting your network in the modern risk landscape. So should be a pretty interesting topic for us today, um, especially with today's um, rapidly changing technology landscape. So we'll go through a lot of stuff and then um, the gentleman from Vertilocity will give us some strategies to, of how you can protect your business in, the, in this ever-changing uh, technology landscape. Um, as we get started this morning here, I'll go through a few housekeeping issues. Um, today's presentation is um, eligible for CPE, so if you're if you have a need for a continuing professional education, all you have to do is stay online for the entire presentation. And we're gonna, we're gonna present you with um, four, set, four uh, question, polling type questions during the presentation, answer all four of those questions, of which the fourth one is gonna be just uh, a real simple yes, no, do you want CP for today's presentation, yes or no? And uh, we'll get you, uh, certificate issued within within about a week. Um, also, we've muted all the incoming lines for the um, today's webinar so that we don't have um, anything uh, dis disrupting everyone else's viewing pleasure. And we're, we plan to leave about five to 10 minutes at the end of today's presentation to do questions. But um, if you do have any questions, you can put them, submit them into the Q&A box and um, if it's if we're if we see them and if it's along with what we're talking about at that time, we'll uh, we'll stop and address the question. Then, otherwise, we'll just collect it and do it at the end. As well as um, Michelle will be sending out an email usually by the end of this week, which is going to have a copy of today's slide deck. I think you can actually get it from a PDF download now, but we'll send you a copy of the slides as well as a link to the recording of today's webinar so that you can um, distribute it to any of your colleagues that weren't able to attend or if you want to go back and do some follow-up. Um, this page here, this is the uh, learning objective section which goes hand in hand with our uh, offering CPE. So these are basically the um, high level version of what what you're going to be able to do or what you're gonna gain from attending today's webinar. Um, just more of a, a requirement of us doing a CPE and making everybody happy. So those are the learning objectives for this morning's presentation. Then I'll go through some, this is my bio. Um, if you've been doing this webinar for any period of time, it's you probably know all about me. I'm. Uh, this is, I've been with HBK for just a little over five years now, and I have a dual role where I, I do most of my work as internal IT security for the firm, but also do do um, client-facing um, projects and have some responsibilities in that area as well. And then I'm gonna, next slide, these are our, our experts that are gonna help us out with today's webinar. You've probably, if you've been coming for a while, you've probably, attended a webinar where Justin or Chris spoke, but then we have uh, Josh Prager, who's uh, joining us from Denver this morning. And uh, this is his introductory um, HBK risk advisor webinar. So welcome to all three of you guys. Um, Justin is a, a principal and primarily focused on account management and business development. And Chris is handling director of the security services for Vertilocity and Josh, the uh, virtual CIO role. So if you guys want, I just did that real quick there. Any of you want to um, jump in and say 
anything in additional that um, that I overlooked there. I don't mean to uh, short any of you. So, Justin, any anything to add to uh, to your bios or anything? No, no, Bill. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> thanks for for the introduction. I uh, appreciate everybody joining us this morning. Excited to to present um, on our topics. Um, you know, we'll, we'll call it two and a half experts, Bill. I know I've mentioned that in the past, but you know, Chris and Josh are, are really the uh, the technical experts. I'm just here to to assist and facilitate. Um, you know, appreciate both of them taking the time to join us, and especially Josh getting up bright and early on the West Coast to present. So, um, not excited, excited to uh, to be here with the team and. and ready to get things rocking and rolling. All right, great. Just, I know if you've attended webinars in the past, Justin says that a lot. So he, <laughs> he, always, sells, he always sells himself short, but, um, but I do appreciate all three of these guys taking time out of their busy schedule to help us out today because they have a ton of knowledge and it always ends up being a good webinar. So yeah. um, without further ado, I'll move us on to our, our first agenda topic of how to succeed, and I'll turn it over to the guys at Vertilocity. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, and you know, I, I think first and foremost, we just want to make sure that you know, everybody's aware this is interactive, right? So if there's questions, if you know, uh, we want to spend a little bit more time on a topic, we really want to make sure that this is um, relevant and valuable to to um, the attendees. So please don't hesitate to, to butt in and ask any questions. Um, and first and foremost, before we dig into the, the technical specifics, right? Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on three elements that are really needed for an organization to be successful in, in truly protecting their organization. Um, you know, that being people, process, and technology. Uh, this is really what drives action within an organization. Um, and, and I mean, essentially, all of these need to be really working in harmony for it to be effective. Um, you, you know, we'll, we'll touch on it shortly, but. You know, being deficient um, in any one of these three areas, you know, can, can really turn a project sideways very quickly. In this slide, I really like because it, it, it shows, you know, those those um, deficiencies and, and then what you can expect in terms of outcomes. Uh, any of these three areas. So, you know, as you can see, pretty self-explanatory, right? No, if, if you don't have people, you don't have process, you don't have technology, um, you're not gonna have any defense. There's there's nothing there. There's no, there's nothing, you know, nothing to build off of. Um, if you only have people and no processes or technology, you know, really you have no ability to execute. You've got the team, they're all ready to go, but hey, we don't have the process and we don't have the technology to, to execute this, right? Um, if you only have the process, it's it's wasted effort. Right? We've got all of this defined, and we know exactly what we want to do, but we don't have buying from the people, and we don't have the technology to facilitate that. Um, you know, burden of scale if if you're short of technology because you're you're, you're not going to be able to, to pursue those goals. Um, inconsistent operation without the processes. Um, I think a, a really important one on this is. The um, having process and technology, but not the people, um, because then you're, you're really looking at poor adoption, right? So you can have all the technology, you can have a huge budget where, where you've purchased every application, and, and you know your defensive posture from a security standpoint is is rock solid. You've got the processes defined. You know exactly you know who's responsible for what, how we are expected to operate within the organization. But if you don't have the buy-in from the people, you know it, it really falls flat. Right. I mean, that's 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 your greatest risk. And it's also your greatest defense is is your employees. So I think that's a really critical one that we see a lot of where you know people throw money at technology. They say, hey, well, we hired somebody to define all of our processes. OK, well, what's 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 the plan for, for getting your people to buy in? What is the recurring education there? How are you making sure that it, it's being adopted? Right. So just be cognizant of that. Um, and then obviously you know, having all three is, is where you're really um, ensuring a successful deployment. So um, just, just critical to be cognizant of that as, as you go through, you know, uh, the recurring exercise of evaluating your, your technology, your security, you know, um, just, just make sure that those three pillars are always in mind. Hey, hey Justin, a couple questions for you on that. So sure. with, um, 
with the the one the outcome of poor adoption where you have like the processes and technology is that you know you hear when you're doing a lot of reading or anything in the you know cyber especially cyber security that you always come across where resources themselves are, are tough to come by so mm -hmm. I would think based on if that if your guys are still seeing that within your practice so that kind of sets you up for poor adoption right there by not being able to find the people. Is that is that why you see that so much, do you think? Um, yeah, Bill, I, I think that's that's definitely a component of it. Um, it. It's just lack of resources. But it's also, you know, it's it's kind of a top down issue, I believe, you know, with, with leadership and really buying into to you know the the desire or need to roll out further security because sometimes it can be um, it, it can be a nuisance it can be another step in a process right where um, you know if, if you've got staff um, seeing somebody in, in a leadership role you know not not adopting you know this this application or we're not um, really buying into to the security posture you know that 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 all you know funnels down to the staff so I think it's a it's a top down issue. It's a it's a, a you know a, a resource availability issue. Um, you just need to have kind of a cohesive plan where you're you're ensuring that you know all employees understand um, the, the the need for security, the why, right? Why are we doing this? You know, we're not just doing this you know as as an exercise um, for for fun, <laughs> essentially, right? I mean, there there are real threats out there. You know, um, continuing education. Uh, another piece with people um, where, you know, it's not a one time, hey, you know, we, we did a, a training, we told them about, you know, why we're doing this and, and we updated them, you know, 24 months ago and, you know, we'll revisit it in another three, four, five years. I mean, it needs to be continuous um, or that adoption will, will fizzle out um, very quickly as well. So then the, the, uh... Artificial intelligence isn't going to save the day because you kind of have to have the process and everything in place for what you're going to use that for. Sure. It's not, it's not the silver bullet that everybody makes it out to be. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a great tool. Um, there's there's no doubt about it. Um, and it, it, it just needs to be a tool in your tool belt. Though. It, it's not the, to your point, Bill, the, the silver bullet, the, the end all be all. We can we can disregard everything else because now we've got this shiny fancy AI tool that's going to keep us protected. Um, you know, people are still your 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 greatest security and also your your greatest uh, uh, threat. So, right. Great, great, thanks. I think that uh, that puts us to our first uh, polling question. So, Michelle, when you um when you see that. Looks like we've had a good representation of people answering that question. Just um, let me know and we can uh, then pick back up with our second agenda topic. All right, looks like everybody's had enough time to, uh, to do that. So we'll, we'll dive back in with agenda item number two. All right, so we're talking about the modern threat landscape, and uh, you know, it's in reality a lot of the threats that we face in the modern threat landscape are, are not truly new. Um, you know, s uh, spam has existed, and, and email phishing has existed in some form or another since the advent of email. Um, Social engineering has existed before there were even computers. Uh, even ransomware, I looked it up, the first instance of ransomware uh, happened in 1989. So the, the, threat, the threats that exist are not really new threats, but we've seen a remarkable advancement in the tool sets that enable these attacks on uh, on businesses and governments and, and really everyone who uses a computer. Um, and we've, we've seen not, not only just the, the tools advancing, but also just the, the commercialization of 
uh, malicious use of computers in the internet. So you know, as we're, we're looking at the modern threat landscape um, and you know the, the anxiety that it gives all of us who, who uh, you know think about the the, the risks, yeah, you know, it it is uh, tr truly remarkable that you know the yeah you know, what used to be just a few people you know claiming to be a Nigerian prince uh, that just need a little help getting their money out of Africa uh, ha has now become a, a, a multi-billion-dollar industry, uh, and certainly the largest uh, threat to businesses. Uh, especially small businesses, is the, uh, the phishing and social engineering. Um, you know, we've all seen the emails coming through that you know, claim to be, yeah, claim to be someone who uh, is asking you to do something. You know, but we, we need you to go out and buy a gift card and, and send us the send us the code on, on the gift card, and, and we've we've. We've seen these emails, but they're getting much more sophisticated. It used to be that an, uh, a phishing email or a, you know, a social engineering email would come come in, and there would be obvious tell, you know, telltales like the English wasn't very good, or it didn't really look like uh, an official source from where it's coming from. And we've seen just an enormous advancement in... Uh, the quality of these emails, uh, text messages, even you know messages through chat like Teams and uh, you know various uh, chat so sources. This is now the the largest risk to small businesses. Uh, IBM recently did a study and said that ninety percent of all breaches in small businesses uh, happen through. Uh, email or social social engineering uh, attacks, uh, where, where uh, someone is trying to convince you to give up information about really your identity, um, username, password, social security number, any any sort of information that they can use then to impersonate you. Uh, so phishing is. Uh, really just tricking a user into entering their credentials or giving up other you know, business information that could be used to impersonate them. Social engineering is tricking a user or uh, an administrator, you know, someone in a privileged pr position, to giving up access to an account. Uh, that was uh, that was what happened very recently in the news with uh, MGM Casino, you know, uh, uh, an employee on the help desk was tricked into letting someone change their password without uh, being able to verify that that was actually the person who the account belonged to. And then, uh, you know, a, a massive attack on MGM uh, occurred from that. The other thing that we're seeing, uh, this goes to that, that tool set becoming uh, you know, better and better. We're seeing an enormous impact from artificial intelligence and starting to see an impact from artificial intelligence, deep fake tools, where um, the AI is you know, sending messages and receiving messages, and they look more and more and more real. And now with deep fake tools, we're starting to see the ability to produce convincing audio and convincing video so that uh, a a malicious uh, individual can even stage a phone call to someone that it sounds like the person that you would expect to be talking to about this. And so we're, we're seeing more and more sophistication in the industry around um, you know, the, the industry of, of data theft, really, uh, uh, around tricking users into believing that they're working with a real person who legitimately should have, you know, should be allowed to talk to you about this information. Uh, and then ransomware, uh, ransomware is really gaining privileged access into a network or into a device and then encrypting the device so that 
legitimate users can't get access to the data. Uh, and more and more, we're seeing it combined with exfiltration attacks, where not only is the data encrypted, but it's also uploaded to the internet where uh, the, the hacker now has a store of your data and they have the decryption key so they can then sell your data or threaten you with exposure of data uh, in order to extort money from you. Uh, typically it comes uh, you know, after the exfiltration or after the encryption or both. Uh, they leave a ransom demand behind where you will see it when you next log into your computer that says this is how you can contact us to uh, gain access to your data or pay us off to not leak it to the internet at large. Other risk that's growing uh, and a growing concern is insider threats. Uh, this is when a user has legitimate access to a network device uh, or a network resource and, um, you know, just in the course of their daily job would, would normally need access to this, but that access is exploited uh, to the detriment of your business. And this is a growing problem uh, largely because of the fact that since COVID-19, uh, the world has become a place of much, much larger mobile workforces uh, where we don't have the same defenses anymore. You know, it used to be that we would create a perimeter of firewalls around our internal network and control everything that goes in and out of the network through those firewalls. And now we have users in coffee shops and at home and you know, all, over, all over the place legitimately needing to connect and work. And so it becomes a much greater risk, you know, if somebody just finds a laptop that's sitting unlocked and decides to do something. It, it, it may not even be the user, but they're using the user's account. So, so it's become a much greater threat just because of the fact that everybody is so dispersed and can't be behind the same controls that we used to have. Hey, Chris, before we, so this is our second polling question, but before we, or while we're doing that, just um, just a question for you. So I was um, actually reading recently, as far as like phishing that, that the, um, the hackers are starting to use like um, LinkedIn and, and Twitter, or I guess I'm supposed to call it X now, but they're mm -hmm. sending phishing basically phishing messages through these, um, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter and whatever, because people, they say their guards are down when they're in those, um, those applications. Have you guys started to see that? We, we definitely have, and there, there's been a very uh, hard push on LinkedIn lately. Um, we see a lot of uh, fake LinkedIn messages that it, especially in email, you know, someone gets an email saying that, uh, you know, a person reached out to them through LinkedIn and wants to talk to them or make up a job offer or things like that. And the typical response is I'm going to click the link in the email and that will open up a page and I will respond to them in LinkedIn. And what happens is it looks like LinkedIn, but it's not or it's going through an intermediary server where there's a server in the middle intercepting what's going on. Um, so it's, it's a huge risk. You know, I've been advising clients, you know, if, you, if you see a message like this from LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn webpage and click on the message in LinkedIn. Don't respond to the email. That way you know it's actually from a legitimate source. Uh, the other thing we've seen is just targeting of legitimate LinkedIn accounts where, you know, through phishing, through social engineering, they're getting access to actual LinkedIn accounts and then using those to uh, basically gather personal information uh, about other LinkedIn users by doing things like making them a job offer that isn't legitimate. Uh, but, you know, it's actually coming from their LinkedIn account. And so it's, uh, it, it seems to the end user, and unless they actually pick up the phone and call the person reaching out to them, uh, you know, they wouldn't have any way to know. Right. Yeah, that, that's pretty scary there because, um, 
everybody thinks they're in a safe environment, but they're not. So yeah, um, just everyone, um, you know, take heed there. That's uh, something to keep in, you know, keep in mind. And uh, did we already get the, the CPE question answered? I think we, Michelle, that looks like everybody, I mean, we, we paused on that one for quite a while. So gotcha. do we need to go okay. back on that, Michelle, or are we good? We're fine. Okay. All right. So I'll let you go on with the next agenda item there, Chris. Or, uh... Okay. So now we want to talk about how do we address these risks. And we, we started to talk about that a little bit. Um, the, the mobile workforce yeah. Again, there there's obvious, obviously enormous benefits to being a mobile workforce and not being tied to a specific uh, office or lo location. Um, but of course, it, it does come with increased risks to security. Um, so you know, we, this has been a, a constant battle for. You know, for, for IT and IT security especially, is how, how do we enable our users to access, uh, you know, access the resources that they need uh, you know, inside the organization, and, and especially now with the growing reliance on cloud and software as a service. Uh, so how how do we enable this without opening up our our security uh, to the to the point where it's no longer uh, protecting us, and really, this is this has come with multiple different avenues of uh, multiple different avenues of, of controls to put in place. So, the first is um, user training, and uh, this this one has historically gotten somewhat of a uh, short shrift, where you know, it, you know management has tended to look for a technical solution to problems, but as we're seeing greater and greater sophistication in toolkits and greater and greater uh, funding behind uh, these, these attacks, we're, we're starting to get to the point where the only way to really reliably control whether or not someone you know, gets caught up in one of these is you know, that the user is in fact making intelligent decisions. So, you know, when a user gets a suspicious email saying, you know, Richard wants me to change my ACH account that payments are going to, well, I know Richard well enough to know that he would never use that phrase. And, you know, th this is actually something that happened you know, it, internally and in, in Vertilocity we had, uh, you know, a request coming from one of our internal users, and it it uh, seemed very, very legitimate, but it, it contained the phrase, would you kindly? And this individual, we, you know, I've known him for 12 years, and I, I know that he has never in the entire 12 years that I've been in Vertilocity used the phrase, would you kindly? Um, and so that that was a tip off that you know I don't think this is real, and uh, you know further investigation of that email caused us to realize that this was not actually coming from an inside account. It was coming from an outside account. It was made to look like it was coming from an inside account. Um, so it, it's it's something that we all have to be on guard for, and just you know looking at you know do I know the person who's sending me this message? And is this actually something that they would say? Does this seem like them? Because it's it's coming down to the point where everything else can be faked, but the, 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 the real knowledge of who I'm talking to. Right, and that, that I, I would just chime in there that, um, you know, I actually get, get a phone call from from one of our uh, principals probably at least every other month where where they talk about somebody that that fell for one of these fishes or you know it's off, often categorized as a business email compromise of which mm -hmm. you know everybody wants it's human nature to to you know react quickly and help people and so they just 
say like, well, change, instead of sending the money where you normally send it, send it here. And like you said, you got to kind of look for the language or, or think why would they be doing this or contact them through their, you know, a channel that you know, not through the email or text message or anything, because the other thing that's really scary here is these are for some big dollar amounts. And when, if somebody tricks you into, let's just pull a number, tricks you into sending $50,000 to the wrong place when you think you're paying one of your vendors. So that, when you look at it and doing the math, that's not going to cost you $50,000. That's going to cost you $100,000 because yep. you're sending 50000 to the bad guy. And then your vendor is still going to come back and put their hand out and say, hey, where's the fifty grand that you owe me? So it's right. like Absolutely. when you make one of these mistakes, it's like du it's double. So that, I mean, I can't stress enough the, uh, you know, training and trying to get people to be well um well versed to to look out for this kind of stuff, but um, yeah, it's pretty scary. Yeah, and, and all of these examples are uh, pretty much real world examples that have happened to us. Uh, yeah, we've we've seen them with our clients. Yeah, we we've seen you know, requests to make a change of payment. Uh, you know, without talking to a supervisor and insisting, you know, it's necessary. Uh, we've even seen you know, demands that you know, payment be made with Venmo or uh, you know, a, a, another payment service. And uh, you know, that's, that's a growing thing that uh, they're trying to extort changes in payment. Hey, you know, move it to this ACH account or send us a wire transfer or pay us with Venmo. Or if we've even seen we need payment in the form of Apple iTunes gift cards. And you think, why, why would anybody fall for that? But they do. And, and it, mm -hmm. it's truly amazing. Uh, we've seen, uh, this was actually a no before campaign, but uh, there was a Dunkin' Donuts coupon. Uh, and if you click here to click here to sign up, it asks you for your Microsoft credentials. And we had a lot of users put in their Microsoft credentials uh, to get their Dunkin' Donuts coupon. And the poor Dunkin' Donuts manager up the street was uh, rather rather concerned when all of these people started showing up with their printed out Dunkin' Donuts coupons <laughs> into the system. Uh, I, I had a client a few weeks ago who was called by the Amazon Fraud Alert team uh, saying that there was, there was access to his account and that they needed him to read the IMEI number out of the settings for his phone, which he has never used for purchasing anything on Amazon. Uh, and the reason that they were trying to do that is because once they have that phone number, they can then intercept text messages to your phone and get around multi-factor authentication because an MFA sent to your phone through a text message would also go to them. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing is just to teach people how to be skeptical because this stuff, mm -hmm. is, it all seems like it could be true, but it's, most yeah. Not. yeah, so we we are seeing as a result of this that there are now uh, better and better enhancements to email protection. Um, and often these are, uh, you know, an upcharged addition to the basic level of spam filtering. Uh, so, you know, that's certainly something you want to talk to your uh, IT team about is, you know, are we using advanced email protection or are we just using basic spam filtering? Um, you know, advanced email protection does things like analyzes links uh, in emails and checks where it's going and make sure that that server that it's connecting to is safe. And then it freezes the link in time. So if that link then is redirected to another server at any point, it will no longer connect. Or, uh, you know, typically also included in advanced email protection is going to be attachment protection, where it does what's called exploding it in the cloud. It, it will take the attachment, launch it in a virtual machine, open the file, analyze everything that happens when that file is opened, make sure there's nothing malicious before it will deliver it to you. And then there's also advanced anti-spoofing where emails will be analyzed to see, okay, does this email have 
the same display name as one of the users in this environment, but it's from another uh, another email account that's not the internal email account of this user. Uh, and you know, measures other. Typically, there's other proprietary information that they're analyzing, but that's always a key: is does it have the same display name? Um, and if so, you know, I'm going to flag this as potential spam or maybe quarantine it or block it altogether. Uh, so that that protection is is starting to enhance and you know get the AI tools behind it that can analyze and counter the uh, malicious AI tools, but it's always a cat and mouse game. Uh, another major change that we're seeing as we've moved to this mobile workforce is an emphasis on identity and access management. Um, because you're no longer behind the protected perimeter of your firewalls and, and all of the controls of the local network. Now that the shift in security focus is really to prove, prove to me who you are and that you should have access to this resource before I give you access to this resource. Because we, we can't just assume that because you're accessing from behind a firewall at an IP address that you are who you say you are and should have access to this. Uh, so the, the first step in identity and access management is really multi-factor authentication, uh, which is uh, the, the idea that a user should not just have a thing that they know, which would be their username and password, but also evidence of something that they are. So like a biometric fingerprint, iris, um, something you know something unique to them or something that they would have like a mobile phone or a physical uh security key that can verify that uh the user is definitely who they say they are because they are this or they have this in addition to knowing the password so with that i'm going to hand it off to josh and he's going to talk about uh, some of the types and benefits of uh, multi-factor authentication that are out there. Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, multi-factor, again, something you have, something you know, something you are, um, in addition to just your password. Um, Everyone knows that, you know, you've probably heard it before, passwords are cheap, they're for sale on the dark web, they exist everywhere. Um, every time there's someone with a breach, there's a giant password dump. It's why everyone tells you not to reuse your passwords. Um, the benefit to MFA is that your password is no longer really all that valuable um, without that second factor that goes behind it. Uh, Chris was talking about that attack where someone tried to get someone's phone serial number to spoof it. Uh, again, your phone is something you have in the modern world. 90 plus percent of people have a modern smart cell phone. Uh, we do still run across a handful of places that don't, and we'll, uh, we can talk about that some more at the end. Um, but some of the types of multi-factor, you're going to have those apps. Um, you've probably, you know, if you're using Microsoft, you've probably seen the Microsoft Authenticator as they've enabled the security defaults uh, across all of the tenants. They're forcing people to start using multi-factor. Uh, in addition to, you know, the Microsoft app, there's the Google Authenticator, there's Duo Mobile, um, there are a ton of other brands. Okta is another uh, MFA, an identity provider. Um, there are a ton of apps that will allow you to provide multi-factor something you have with your phone. Um, they do that in a multiple of ways as well. Some of them will do those push notifications. Um, you know, you'll get a notice on your phone, hey, some so-and-so is trying to sign in. Hopefully it's you and you're trying to sign in. Um, but if it's not, then you can tell it, hey, no, I'm not signing in. Um, some will send text messages. Um, a lot of the apps I mentioned before will have kind of a one-time passcode that has a 30-second lifetime. So you can open the app and you can watch the codes change every 30 seconds. Um, those, that's a unique pairing between your phone and the service that allows you to authenticate securely with that one-time passcode. Um, in addition, there's the message-based MFA. You get that text message that gives you that six, eight, ten digits. I've seen some with ten digits. 
you put that code back in, it proves you're you. Uh, a lot of times when you're using Microsoft systems, they'll email you a code uh, to the email you have on file. Um, if you don't have access to either of those, some services will even allow you to call a desk phone um, or a specific number that you specify, and you'll press a specific number or to approve or deny that. So, you know, hey, press pound to approve, press nine to deny. Um, Microsoft can call you and do that. Other services offer that as well. Um, it really allows you to adapt to whatever the situation is and make sure that you're authenticating. Um, some of the newer and more uh, robust um, items are also MFA tokens. Um, you know, back in the day, you'd get those tokens from the bank and it would have a six or eight digit kind of code that would randomly toggle. Uh, those were uniquely paired to your account to access that system. Um, the newer version of that that really has amped up the security is what's called a FIDO2 key. Um, they're they have a multitude of interfaces, so they're USB. Uh, they have that near field or Bluetooth type communication to essentially say, hey, if you have this key and it's in your phone, it's in your computer, it's near your computer, it allows you to prove that you are who you say you are. Um, some of the nice parts about those in from a security perspective is those are single session based. Um, in English, when you sign into your Office 365, it allows you to sign into that specific piece with that FIDO2 key. Um, which means that if you sign into something else, you're going to have to do it again and again and again. It's only good for that one thing that you're logging into. Um, a big thing we've been seeing with multi-factor and people bypassing it is stealing of your session or your, your key that says, yes, this session is secure. Um, Microsoft by default has a 90 day lifetime, um, on your, your session key. So if someone's able to compromise and intercept that in some fashion, they can have access to your account for up to 90 days and that's rolling. So if they're accessing it again and again, they're going to live in your environment. 502 keys really tamp down on that because you can't steal the key. It's only good for that one session. So as we see the security change and people start learning how to evade or manipulate MFA to their benefit, security is also adapting to ensure that we're able to help keep you safe. Let's go to the next one. So in that vein, um, there's other ways to really control those, these access types. Um, so conditional access is really the big one. And we, we love pushing out conditional access. Um, it's an add on to a lot of the native things in Microsoft. Um, but it lets you do things like geolocation. If your company is entirely based in the U S and no one should ever be working from outside the country, you can create a couple of very simple rules that says, if your IP address that you connect to is outside of the United States, deny it access wholesale. Um, and that really closes your attack surface. Um, you're able to poke holes in that for people that travel. So if someone wants to go to Europe and they're gonna be in Germany and France for a week, you can make a rule to allow them access from there. Um, there's a ton of other ways to leverage that conditional access. You know, Chris was mentioning, you know, being behind a firewall. We can mark a physical office location as a safe location where users don't have to provide MFA if they're in the physical office. Um, you can also apply this down to the application level. Hey, we only want people to be able to use Outlook on their phones and they shouldn't be able to get into Teams or SharePoint. Um, or, hey, we need to make sure that people that use our VPN are using approved devices to connect from. So you can apply that those rules and that multi-factor against specific applications. Um, again, I mentioned, you know, approved devices. We can leverage, you know, Intune. Um, there are other mobile device management suites as well that allow you to mark devices as compliant. You build a set of rules that a device must conform to to meet those compliance. So it needs to be encrypted. It needs to have the antivirus that we're running. It needs to be up to date. And if your device doesn't meet these three criteria, it's not allowed to connect. Um, and you can even get down to you know the allowed protocols. We're only allowing these types of ports, these types of devices to communicate with these types of services. So it really allows you to put some very, very granular controls around who's interacting with your network and how they're doing so. Um, so again, it helps control 
who's accessing your devices, who's accessing your network and how they're doing it. So again, if you're, you know, if you manage to bypass one of those controls, there are other controls in place to help really control some of that security. All right, so we've got some do's and some don'ts for multi-factor. Um, I'm going to say this one, and it's, it, it seems obvious to us, but only approve uh, logins when you're actually trying to log in. Uh, we had a user um, with a very high net worth that a you know family financial investment company approve every single push notification he got for multi-factor on his phone. He allowed the hackers to bypass MFA because he had push fatigue. He got so many pushes, he just started hitting yes, assuming that he needed to. Um, we changed the way he gets his codes to adapt for that. Uh, but if you're not actively trying to sign in, hit no. If you're getting three, four, five, six pushes, reach out to your IT and your security teams someone probably has your password and is trying to hack you. Um, again, I always say that seems obvious, but I tell that to every single user I configure, if you are not actively trying to sign in, hit no. We can always hit yes the second time if you need to, but that first no will save you a lot of pain. Um, keep your authentication apps up to date. Uh, you know, update your phone security system. Uh, you know, iPhone releases updates, Android releases updates do your updates just like you do on your computer. Uh, it's very important that you maintain that level of security. Um, a lot of apps now will allow you to back them up. Um, so, you know, if you lose your phone or you break your phone, or you get a new phone, you don't have to reconfigure multi-factor across 20, 30, 40 sites. I know the number I have in my phone is very high. So a backup and restore allows you to not have to deal with that. Um, back it up somewhere safe. Um, if you're getting, I, and again, if you're getting prompts at weird times of the day, you know, if you're not normally working at three in the morning and you wake up and you had pushes from two, three in the morning, let your IT team know, um, you know, we're, we're going to want to review that to see what happened, where it came from, why you're getting strange pushes at odd hours. Um, if you're getting requests for things that you don't normally log into, let someone know, um, you know, you've. A lot of this is user-based and, you know, Chris alluded to it earlier, Justin alluded to it at the top, people drive security. Um, we can put all the tools in place that you want. All it takes is one user that isn't paying attention and everything falls apart. Uh, just like the, you know, the, the casino hacks, um, someone convinced a user to do something they shouldn't have done. Um, things not to do with your MFA, never, ever, ever, give someone your one-time codes. Um, if your IT needs to reset it, we can send it from the system. It will look legitimate. Uh, we don't need your codes. We have ways to bypass your MFA um, for you to allow you to reset it or reconfigure it, but never ever give out the codes. Uh, like I alluded to before, don't approve sign-ins at odd hours. If you're on the couch at 9.30 and you're watching a movie and you get a push request for MFA, hit no. If you're not working, if it's not you, you're not sure, hit no. If you get a couple, alert your IT team. And the kind of the number one is don't get complacent. It's easy to just assume that, oh, I need to give MFA because it, it dinged. If you're not, again, I, I've said it twice, I've said it three times. If you're not actively trying to do something, hit no. Let your IT team know, we will be there to help you. Um, so, it's we can undo almost anything but we can undo an approval so you drive the security especially with this you know something you know something you have don't give away what you have yeah josh that while <clears throat> excuse me while the uh the audience is doing the uh, polling question that the company that i worked for prior to coming to hbk we had a situation just like what you described where this person was they had their phone and they were sitting down it was like after 11 in the evening they were watching tv and they got the mfa question to their phone and the person said yes <laughs> that, like yeah. the bad guy right in their system yep um and that's probably the hardest thing to you know teach people is it's only going to prompt when you need it and you should be you'll be in front of your computer or you'll be setting up a new account on your phone or your eye or your tablet it's not a passive thing that's just going to pop up randomly 
you're going to be actively doing something for you to get a push or a prompt for that. Um, so anytime you're not working and you get a prompt, uh, 99.9% .9 of the time it's fake or malicious. Um, yeah, and we're it. also starting, we're also starting to see some reaction from the identity providers to, to respond to this uh, push fatigue where you, know, you, you may see now when you get a multi-factor authentication pu uh, push, it's also going to have two or three char you know, characters on the screen and you have to type those characters into your uh, app before you can hit accept. And a lot of people get really frustrated with that. It's one more step. Um, but it is to verify that, hey, you are actually trying to log into something right now um, to, to get around that that push fatigue of just, I'm going to hit yes because it prompted me. Yeah, it's, it's uh, quite uh, sometimes, you know, you scratch your head at what people are willing to do or, or do by mistake. But um, well, thanks very much for, for all that information. So we're going to wrap up here. And I think we've got one last final uh, CPE question for people to to answer and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll go to questions. Um, so if you do want um, CP for today's um, session, be sure to answer yes. And then um, we'll move on here to, uh, to our questions now. So we've got the um, contact information of everyone on today's uh, webinar. So the, the Vertilasi guys are the they know a lot about all this stuff that we've talked about, so you can reach out directly to them. Or if you have a question for me, I can get you in contact with um, with somebody from Vertilocity. So, um, Michelle, do we have any questions that have popped up on today's um, webinar? Uh, we had one that was submitted. The question is, I love the idea of MFA, but I don't want to use my cell phone. What else can I do? Um, Absolutely. Josh, you um, yep, I'm going to grab that. So that's that's a very common objection. I, I have some clients where people don't have cell phones. Um, and in today's day and age, that sounds really weird, but it 100% happens. Um, you know, like like I discussed, there are other ways around that. If you have a desk phone, we can call that. Um, we can get those tokens or those FIDO keys uh, in place of, of a cell phone. So we do have some alternatives to using cell phones. Um, the other very common objection we get is, well, I don't want to use my personal phone for work. Um, and I've had some very aggressive pushback in that area as well. Um, so again, kind of the same objections occur here. We get you, you know, if you have an office phone, set it up with dial-based authentication it means you can only work at the office, but it does allow us a way to secure that. Or we get one of those token or FIDO keys um, that again, doesn't require you to have your phone be in use. So there's really no reason to not adopt MFA across the organization. Um, there's ways to overcome all of those objections to uh, phone use. So Josh, when you do, when you have that, I'm, I'm assuming that it's also possible that if somebody does use their cell phone for MFA, but they forget it that day. Is there a way that you can work around that for the temporary, like give them an alternate um, way to get answer that MFA question? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of the things that we see are that you can set up multiple ways to do it. So I know when Microsoft sets you up, typically they want you to use the app, but you can also add your cell phone or, a, or an office phone line. So you can select more than one option um, and it, so if you lift, if you've left your cell phone, you can have it call it a, a kind of a second or third option uh, to bot to allow you to access that still in the secure fashion, but with some alternate methods. Um, some other services also allow us to generate uh, kind of single use bypass codes. Um, so I know we use a lot of Duo. Uh, Duo will allow you to generate a single use passcode for a user and it's good for a set number of hours. Um, so we can go back and allow you to access everything still securely, um, but to work around sometimes those left or forgotten phones. Cool. That looks like we uh, we got just one other question here that I'm seeing, and I'm not sure who would be the best to answer, but probably one of the guys from Vertilocity for sure. It's regarding um, zero trust. 
Are, are you guys starting to see a lot of people implementing zero trust security policies? So we've had some interest in zero trust and primarily driven by uh, cyber insurance groups. Um, you know, they, there have been a lot of vulnerabilities lately discovered around uh, SSL VPNs. And so, uh, you know, the, the cyber insurance industry is starting to say, you know, we, we don't like you having an SSL VPN. We want you to use something else and they'll recommend using our trust. Uh, so we've, we've done some exploration of zero trust, uh, but what we have found with uh, a lot of the clients that are, that are investigating that is they no longer even have servers that they need to access in office. All of their access that they need to control is to cloud service providers. And so We've not actually had, I don't think we've actually had any clients that ultimately moved to that zero trust model in the small business space, just because what they're trying to access is no longer internal and they don't need to facilitate. So a lot of times we're just decommissioning the VPN because they, they no longer need access to the internal network from outside. Um, certainly, we've, we've got some clients that are still exploring, and, and we may be moving towards that direction for some of our larger clients. Um, and there, there are benefits, you know, with, with zero trust, you can control access within the network at a greater level, as well as outside access into the network. Um, so, yeah, some of our larger clients are looking at that as a, as a uh, potential avenue that they want to explore in the next year or so. But but at this point, we have not had any clients actually choose to implement. So that that's something that like if if it's the insurance industry that's driving that, that's probably going to get to be where you're going to be dealing with I, it more and more. I would imagine, um, certainly, and like I said, mostly it's been our smaller clients that, that have approached us with it so far, and we've we've ultimately come to the conclusion you, know, you, you don't need to allow the outside access right. at all. Uh, but the larger clients that have significant internal infrastructure, I think that is certainly the way it's going to go over the next one to two years is, right. uh, yeah. Great, great. Thanks. SSL, VPN, SSL VPNs are just going to go away, I think, because of all of the all of the vulnerabilities that keep continuing with all of the providers to to be uh, discovered. Right, right, great. Thanks, thanks, Chris, and um, also thanks to uh, to Josh and to Justin for helping us out today. I hope that everyone on the webinar found it um, very interesting and worthwhile, and. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or one of the gentlemen from Fertilocity and uh, just a, a placeholder. Our next webinar is scheduled for uh, Wednesday, October 25th at uh, 10 a.m. So again, thanks very much to uh, Justin, Chris, Chris and Josh. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day and um, thanks for attending. Thanks everybody.